Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, and I believe that all readers should read children's literature, especially adults. So that's what we do on the Kid Lit Love podcast. We celebrate all things children's literature, picture books, early readers, middle grade, and young adult novels too. Whether you're an adult reading to your inner child or connecting the young readers in your lives with fantastic books, you've come to the right place. Each week, we'll talk to a different children's literature author and discuss their books, their hopes and dreams for readers, their writing process, and much, much more. So grab a notebook to build your TBR, and let's get to today's episode of Kid Lit Love. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm Stephanie, your Kid Lit Loving host, inviting you to another weekly conversation with a children's literature author. This week, I'm talking with Matt Landis. Matt is the author of multiple middle grade novels, including League of American Traitors, The Not-So-Boring Letters of Private Nobody, It's the End of the World as I Know It, Operation Final Notice, and his newest that we're talking about today, National Archive Hunters. Capital Chase, a series starter that was just released in May 2024. He's here to talk about all the things, his work, his writing, his books, and his really cool adventure he has planned for 2025. Matt, welcome to the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. This is awesome. This is a great way to end my day. My kids are gone. My I'm in my classroom and I'm just hanging out talking about books, which is great. <laughs> it is a good way to end the day. And I'm I think on school oh. Wi-Fi. If my bosses hear this, don't worry. I'm on my cellular plan. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't wait for a conversation because based on what I've seen in your writing, on your website, and social media, I feel like it's going to be a really fun conversation. <laughs> fun. It's going to be a good time. So I read, actually, I listened to on your website that one of your main goals in your work, in your writing, in your books, is to make history not boring. So I think that's a good place for us to start, for you to kind of tell us a bit about you, your teaching, your books, your goals. All of it. Start wherever you'd like. Yeah. So I've been teaching. Um, it's funny. I'm in my classroom thinking. I'm, I'm. I've been in this exact room for about 15 years. So 17 years teaching total, uh, which sounds like a long time. I guess I'm almost halfway through my career. Um, and I really, my subject historically, pun intended, is like the worst. It's usually the bottom ranking for most middle school kids in terms of boredom. It's just. The old school way of history that maybe you and I were taught, you know, memorize every battle of the Civil War. That's awful. It's just terrible for learning. So we don't do it anymore, but it's still considered to be really boring. So I went to grad school for my master's in history um, when I was in early on teaching. And when I came in here to my classroom, I I wanted my students to not hate it. I, I think I had a deep fear of not engaging students. And I knew that I liked my topic and you always have those teachers who can kind of haul you along with their, you know, powerful personality, but the activities in the subject area had to be engaging. And so from the very beginning, I had amazing mentors who, uh, during my student teaching and then on the first couple of years, and even now to my, my current team that we were always just challenged. Okay. Let's make this, we've got to do the work of history. We've got to be engaging. And so um, that's kind of what I try to translate into, into my classroom. We just finished our civil war field day last Friday. where like, we went outside the culmination of the big civil war unit. And like, we built these campus tents and we taught the kids out of March and we played town baseball. Um, two weeks ago, I did this live surgery activity that we do every year where we pretend to cut off someone's leg and talk about medicine and surgery and technology. And all that is just part of the mission of the classroom, which is make it not like you have to do it. Stakes have to be, ha- have to be high. Kids have to care. Um, and so when I started writing, I, I wanted to do the same thing. I, I thought these stories were cool. History was cool. But like, you know, I wanted to to make it come alive for students. And so my first book, League of American Traders, kind of had that bent. Not so boring letters of private nobody. It kind of went to the young adult, I'm oh, sorry, the, uh, the middle grade, the, the kind of the seventh grade arena, which is what I taught. And then this is, I feel like, where I kind of want to live for like the next two decades in this new <laughs> series, where I sort of just meld both 
you know, real life, but with high adventure stakes and history and kind of meld them together and make it matter for both the kids in the story, but also America's past, because um, it does get a bad rap, the subject area, but I think it has to matter to kids. And so my goal is to kind of make it matter without making up too much stuff, if I cannot do that. But that's kind of like the mission in the classroom and in the books. So that's what I, that's what I want for kids to see, that it's not boring, that it's actually tragic, hilarious, exciting, weird, confusing. It's so many things, but boring. So that's my mission. Yeah. So across all of your books, before we jump into the one we're talking about today, what are some of those historical events that you wanted to put in your books to make them come alive in that way? Yeah, so I teach US one, which is like the revolution, which is like the British colonization up to like the end of World War, the, the end of civil war and, and kind of immigration. And so the Revolutionary War, you think about the two benchmarks, you got the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, kind of the great benchmarks. And so my first book, Leaving American Traders, I had this idea: like, what if like founding fathers were still hanging out in these cool clubs? Like, hey, we're like descendants of George Washington, whatever. And that'd be great. That'd be awesome. But like, what if you were like a descendant of the you know, traders or the loyalists? Like, what would that be like? And then, like, what if they were still persecuting those people? So it's kind of like an alternate history, kind of. And so my main character, Jasper, he finds out he's Benedict Arnold's sixth-generation descendant, which is, like, the worst traitor ever. And the founding fathers are actually hunting him down because there's still this vendetta. So, like, that was a little more, like, playing with history, throwing in some Revolutionary War stuff. And a lot of descendants came alive in, in the current day, which I always try and make it present. Um, and not supporting letters of private nobody, my agent was like, why don't you write a book for about your classroom? And I'm like, well, I'm a young adult author. I want to write for high school kids. She's like, well, you teach eighth graders. Why don't you write a book for them? Yeah. So I had this archetype of a student one year who was like this total history nerd, super awkward. And a lot of parts that you know, those are pieces of, of an author are kind of always in their work. And part of me kind of felt like that in middle school. I loved the subject, but I did enough sports to balance out my history nerdery. Um, but I had this, what, what, you know, this kid who's super awkward, gets assigned a project, the worst partner ever. And that is about the civil war. So they have to research a local civil war soldier and they do the project and they actually end up uncovering this like 150 year old secret from their town, um, about this guy and they go to Gettysburg and So that was like a school project meets social studies meets, you know, civil war. And then I kind of took a, the next two books in that series are just unrelated to history, just about, um, stories in those kids. And then this new series is kind of now really setting roots down in locating itself in DC and, and the revolutionary American revolutionary era. Like what um, the relics that these kids are hunting are things that are stolen all from the revolutionary era. So that's kind of how to get across. And, and, and to start talking about that book, you know, as, as a student, if I think back to myself as an eighth grader, um, <laughs> Yeah, history, social studies, definitely not, not my passion. Yeah. However, I was the dutiful student, you know, I love to read. And so I could read, I could memorize, I could, I could give you the facts, but I, I didn't embody it very yeah. well. And so I love that as an adult reader, I was reading your book and, and your newest one, National Archive Hunters, Capital Chase. And the Matt, I was in it. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't remember this stuff being interesting. I don't remember, you know, and, and obviously you have a wonderful story around it that pulls yeah. the reader yeah. in to get excited about those facts. But I kept thinking, did I know about any of these things, any of these people, any of these places, any of these books? So on your website, you kind of tongue in cheek say, parents, teachers, if your child reads this book and they still think that history is boring, I'll give you a hundred bucks, which is not <laughs> Because you're a teacher and a writer and have no money. no money. I definitely, you know, I think I'd have to pay you because I was like, oh, no, it's history. It is so interesting. It's interesting. It's funny. You've got these two characters that readers just get behind in two very different ways um, immediately. And then I don't give spoilers, but then you just have like this twist at the end that was... <laughs> That was wonderful. So I, I loved the book. I felt gypped as an eighth grader that I didn't get to get, you know, that kind of engagement in, <laughs> in history. Uh, but tell us about that book. I, I gave a little sneak peek, but from your perspective, tell us about National Archive Hunters, Capital Chase, the series Kickstarter, if you will. 
Yeah. So the key is, and I've learned so much in my writing career, um, the hardest thing, honestly, with any writing, of any book, and especially a middle grade book, which is, it's funny, my wife always thinks middle grade is middle school, but middle grade is really, they say eight to 12. So that could be a third, that, that could even be a second grader. Um, so, you know, Junior Library Guild put this on their list and, and they have it rated as a, as a second grade plus. So that, that's a large span. But when you're writing a book for this age, what, what matters is the stakes. This, and my editor, my all, all my book concepts always struggled with, what are the stakes? Like, why does anyone care? The reader has to care about the story's stakes or it doesn't matter to them. And so with history, you're kind of at a double advantage. Well, disadvantage. Well, who cares about old stuff that is in the past and much less relics, old people? Who cares? Yeah. So the goal in the opening of this this first opening series, uh, this book in the series, is to, is to kind of introduce the readers to, and this is where you kind of have to introduce the storylines. Well, why should we care about these kids and their life and the city and American history? And so um, these are, I have twins. My twins are four and a half. So I, I, I've always been attracted to this idea of what it's like to be a twin race. I've taught so many twins and, and grilled them over the years. It's kind of seen as like a trope in writing sometimes the twin aspect, but at the same time, it's real life. So I these twins are, by the way. so I, I have twins. Yeah. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. You totally, um, it's a wild. Boy. And so these twins are 10 years old. You, they're they're clearly the above average, um, you know, from the get go. She's an uh, Iris is a superb athlete. Um, she's just hands and feet above everyone in here, her own age, her age group and otherwise. Um, so that's kind of her thing. Photographic memory. Um, she's super smart, but she's overshadowed by the nerd of the family, which is Ike. He's just the classic blunt brute force, you know, bare knuckle fact eater that's just kind of who he is um he, he struggles with um, personal interactions at times he doesn't care about how your feelings he says what's true because it's true and needs a little bit of polish and so at the start of this story you know right who cares about history that he loves it um their mom runs a family museum it's a very small museum in dc called the americana and these boutique museums do exist in the capital i base this off one um uh in uh, the hillier in dc which is in uh, foggy bottom and so their mom runs it in the family. The museum is in financial distress. And so on the opening night of the spring gala, of the fall gala, excuse me, um, a girl of their age uh, steals something from the museum. And it's something small. And like, who cares? And yet what we find out is that small one tiny thing is actually just that last, you know, leg that just gets kicked out and the whole museum is thrown into chaos and now these uh these twins are going to take it upon themselves to uncover and try and figure because the fbi is not going to help them because who cares about a stupid thing that was stolen that died worth five thousand dollars they don't trust them they don't think they're going to do it so they take in their own hands to to use a national archives where mom is working part-time because they're almost you know they're out of money to try and figure out well who would even steal this and that is kind of where the thread just starts to unravel other things are then stolen under similar shady circumstances. The FBI begins to think they themselves are um, part of this and they have to sort of work their way out of it. Um, it races from Philly to DC to Boston, up and down the Eastern seaboard. Um, and it's just got a lot of action, you know, kind of high octane stuff. Cause again, the stakes have to matter. And so obviously the high stakes are death, which my editor's like, you know, at some point we're going to have to threaten their lives. Maybe not in this book, but in later books. Um, but so this, this book is really about a race to save these artifacts because it's going to save the family museum who cares about America's artifacts. You could say, well, a few, a handful of people, but this family, it matters to them. It's going to ruin their lives. Um, if they don't do it and it's on the twins to figure it out. Yeah. I loved this family. You've got a family that is all in, like yeah. all in together, all in on just learning and and growing and unapologetically ab about it and everybody's gifts. And because I also have twins too, I, I love reading about them because it is, I have boy girl twins. So I don't have the whole I identical thing going on. Um, but just seeing, seeing the level of kind of character development and the transformation and the connection between those two and the journey they were on side by side, this really cool information and this mystery and this action that they were solving. Like you, you had me coming and going in both ways because I was in it for the cool things I was learning, but I was just so enamored 
with these yeah. two and their yeah. gifts and what how they were using them and yeah. how they knew like yeah i'm a kid i'm gonna solve this uh, you know the fbi yeah. eh, not so much and um as you mentioned um they didn't mind telling the fbi that either which <laughs> which cracked me which you go. Oh, and we're trying to get nicholas cage out of retirement i'm just saying that's like our <laughs> goal yes and there's a couple of roles in this film. I mean, he could play, but the the thing is like the, the, when you're writing a story and this is what's so hard about who knows what makes a book sell. No one really knows, right? What makes a book a hit? It's got to have, um, you have to care about the characters and, and this family, the goal is to make them real, but also make them a little bit, you know, there's a suspension of disbelief. People say, well, how, how would kids help the FBI? It's like, well, okay, we have to give them some superpowers. What is it that they have? And then what, what, powers we call them you know what what abilities it's probably a better word does the family offer do the characters offer to create and of course this, this book builds up to set up the series that these this family and these friends can actually help real solve a serious issue because the, the greatest stake you could argue other than death is is crime right and so there's a lot of it out there. this is why by the way true crime and crime books are huge for adults and for kids right that i mean the thriller chases on um, and what better, you know, crime than stealing America's past, if you will, in a sense, um, cause there's, I mean, there's a lot of money. It's funny. My students were just finished the civil war uh, yesterday. And when Grant and Lee, this is a nerdy side note that, that many people will find boring, but it's important when Grant and Lee are signing, um, the surrender at Appomattox courthouse in Wilmer McLean's farmhouse, as like, as soon as it's over. Union soldiers are ransacking that room for goods. Like they know these artifacts will become valuable. They buy it off of Wilmer McLean, the owner, for like a, a terrible rate for him. I think they bought everything for like a hundred bucks. And before long, they're they're giving them as gifts, relics. They're like, it's like, so like this is a real thing. And America loves to cherish their relics. And of course, we house the documents. Um, and they they go for auction all the time private auctions, public auctions, and it would be not inconceivable that there is some shady force out there that's manipulating and or in, involved in that. <laughs> and at the same time, this book is funny. It's fun. It's funny. The kids are, they're funny. They're a little snarky. They're a little sassy. Like I really love, and I know this is because you've been a middle school or a, you know, a middle school teacher for a while. Like you've captured children and their reality I, I i just loved it i thought i bet you he has a notebook of like all the students <laughs> that his kids say that maybe wander into this book because that you just felt present in the banter it was great thank you and you know what's funny that the greatest compliment that i still get is from parents and teachers who say what you just said that like Okay, trade reviews, I need to sell books. That's great. I want those, right? Stars, those are great. But when a parent or a teacher logs on some random Goodreads review and says, OMG, this sound just like my students. Yeah. That is like, yes. Because we both read, you and I'm sure, a lot of books from this age group written by people who think they know what it's like, but they don't live with kids. And parents know, especially, but being a teacher, and this is why people are like, are you going to quit teaching and write? Number one, I, I need I need the benefits. It's all about the bennies. <laughs> Number two, I I think I would lose something. Like when I'm I I've live, been living with kids for 17 years in the classroom, and of course every student is different. But there's a tone and there's a humor and there's um, honestly a level of trust and familial sense that a classroom has. Um, and I love my students and I love the way that they interact. Um, and and the thing is. It's harsh a lot of times. Like I tell, you know, I, when I when I, I talk to parents and teachers, my students are capable of such great kindness and yet such great cruelty. I mean, the the sharpness that, but that's the beauty of being a teacher, right? I get to model that and and work with it and correct it, and we get to help redeem it. Um, but when I when 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 you and when other people say this sounds like a student, that's all that matters because I would be I would just feel completely ungenuine disingenuous if I was writing in a way that like, would a kid say that? Um, right. And so that, that was kind of the goal to always be, always be authentic in yeah. the ways in which kids experience life. And that's why the kids are really going to gravitate towards it, right? They, they, like we learned in this book, kids often don't have a filter, whether they don't have one or they don't want to put one on. 
And yes. as they read this, like they're going to feel like, okay, this guy gets it. Like it's real. This isn't a sugar coated. That would never happen in middle school in a, in a family. Like it's, it's so real yet funny that they're just like, they're in it. They're in it. And they're getting all of this cool historical facts along the way, which I loved in the back. You all, you know, you had this extra, um, yep back matter that's kind of going over all the historical pieces or the events or the the things um and you say okay this is true <laughs> this is like you know part part of the story and i imagine that's really important to you as a teacher of yeah. this content it is you can't like you can never be the, you know when I, when we talk about plots because the publisher the story of the book is cool. My my old editor from my first book was like, she's at a new press and she's like, hey, let's write this book. And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. I thought she was kidding. Yeah. You know, she's like, no, really. I saw this thing. Let's write it. And whenever you plan a book out like this, because the publisher made me plan five books, which we hope there are five. Who knows? They made me plan what's the world. And when you plan it, they're like, okay, like, is this real? In other words, is there enough of a foundation? And the beauty of history is, there is so much real stuff that is funny, weird, hilarious, confusing that you can build a legitimate plot around it. Like I'm never starved for source material, which is the best. Now, at times you do have to finesse or totally make up. And I used to be, I used to get really weird about that, but I, I, don't, I don't care anymore because I'm not writing a historical fiction novel. I am writing a thriller that it has a history adventure to it. So... I always love clarifying at the back of the book. And often people are very surprised actually what they thought was fake was real and what they thought was real is totally made up. So one of the elements, not no spoilers, but in this book, you know, these artifacts, you know, um, you know, that are found, most of them did exist, but the ones that don't, they probably could have, or are close to ones that might've. So, um, I mean, there's so much real stuff out there. I literally lived this book's plot. Um, I went to DC I went to every place these twins lived and did life. I biked their bike lanes. Yes. I, uh, I I went to the National Archives. I had a good research spot. I got a card. I did the PowerPoint. Just all, all the things these twins do. I asked, I mean, the, the workers there, I, I told them, you remember this? I was here. This is going to be famous one day. They're like, we're smirking at me. I'm like up and down to the locker, storing my stuff. Uh, I checked out some random sources just to, to see what it was like. It was awesome. Um, and in the process of doing that, you really just see um, there's it's funny because there's a lot of actual historians who are actually work in there and probably like, who's this punk who's taking up space, uh, wasting our time. But it, there's so much there and there's so much to be found. It's almost like I worry now, like my brain will sometimes spin at night. Do I have enough time to ever even write all these great right. you know, ideas um, that that could become potential plot lines who yeah. knows <laughs> well i hope for at least a couple of more because i do have to mention you left this book on a cliffhanger i read you know i thought this this isn't the last page he's gonna give us a little something and then i turned the last page and i saw the back matter and i went no yep. so so when is i know I'm, I'm thinking ahead but how long do i have to wait to figure so, out you have to wait a year unfortunately i know it's painful next may may uh, probably hopefully been the same tuesday in may may 2025 um yeah. if you want a clue listeners on the cover of the book you have to hunt for the clue but there is a clue of the uh cliffhanging nature because the thing is if you write a book right like okay there's like plot levels right and and the best movies tv shows books are always books that have multiple interwoven plot lines you got your a level b level c level and often c level is like family stuff whatever what are characters growing through but then the a and the b are ones that are top level but then there's an underarching theme and those give a series legs and so in this series there is no spoilers but there is a international element that's involved here that sort of is the cliffhanger that will give this story uh, so many places to go um and so the next one comes out, um, sequel comes out in uh, next May 25. And, and we have a title. The title is actually this is the, the debut title we're announcing. It's called oh, yeah. Eternal, Eternal Flame is the title. Um, unless, of course, the publisher changes it or sues me for releasing that early. Eternal Flame. We have a cover. 
the cover is uh, nearly complete. And um, yeah, so the, the journey will take them. I, I won't say where, but let's just say they're going to cross the Atlantic. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait. It really, it, that was a, a big, a big, oh no, I've got to ask them how long I have to wait for this because it just, gosh. I was probably can find someone to get you an advanced copy this summer sometime once I finish the edits, but yes. I did I talk about that one too. Yeah. So next year, yeah, you have a really cool project plan that I would love for you to talk about. It is the coolest thing I've I've heard in a while. Yeah, so I I'm almost halfway done my teaching career, and a buddy of mine took what's called a sabbatical from his job, which is not teaching. And I'm like, huh, I've heard that term, sabbatical. Basically, you get a break from work, and you get some pay, but not all your pay, and then you have the freedom to do something, take classes. Sometimes you take a mental health leave, whatever. And I never thought I could do that because obviously I had me, my wife uh, is a former teacher. She tutors and she uh, teaches preschool class, um, but she not full time. And so obviously financial is the biggest concern. We got four kids, we got 10, eight or nine, seven, and four, uh, four and a half year olds, twins. So a lot, big family. Um, and so my, I started with the goal of, can I quit my job and travel America with my family? <laughs> talking about books. So I was like, goal one. And I let that seat sit in my brain. And, and I would I would say these things to my wife. I'm like, hey, do you think I can quit my job? She's like, no, we would have no money. I'm like, okay, so we can't quit my job. Um, what about plan B? Okay, can I kind of quit my job? Can I take a sabbatical, half a year, get 75% of my salary, and yet have half a year to take classes? I've got to take some classes. And then travel. And so I, I, you know, checked with, you know, union. I checked with, you know, um, everyone I need to check with. Because it wasn't going to hide it. It was like, I'm not going to, my district has supports my writing. But I wasn't going to be dishonest. Um, and so I applied for a sabbatical, um, a professional development sabbatical, where I'm going to take nine, nine credits, three classes. And I'm also going to travel America um, and talk about making history not boring and reading not boring um, all across this amazing country. I want to see the nation. I want to see that. Like when you, my wife and I went to New York City about two weeks ago. First time we've been away overnight in four years because of their kids. <laughs> and we walked Manhattan Island. We walked 17 miles over two days. When you walk a city, you just drink it in. And I want to drink in America in a way I haven't before. I've been to many places uh, all over, but I want to drive it. So. We are leaving. I, I start my, my first, um, I think I start the 20, 28th is my last day at 2025, January 28th. And then we are doing a week of visits, things around here. And then we're head off to Richmond and the tour starts. And so we're going down the Eastern Seaboard and we're going to go West Texas, all the way to California up and then over back over up to the Dakotas and the Badlands and Mount Rushmore. And I have been blown away. I mean, when you plan something in your head, you know, it's scary. This is the biggest risk I've ever taken as a teacher. You know, think about it. Salaried, safe. And I'm like, all right, let's jump. And so I've got to find an RV. I've got to, we're going to homeschool our kids. The biggest fear was, can I get enough schools to host me? Yeah. Um, are there people out there that want to do it? I've done a lot of school visits here, do about eight or so a year. And that's easy because it's here. It's local and it's, you know, I don't have to worry about supply and demand. But I needed, I mean, I need almost 60 schools to say, we're going to yeah. bring you in. And I'll tell you what, I've been blown away. I am closing in on 80% bookings. And I've only been, I've been hounding people. If you've got an email from me, I mean, you listen to this, I'm sorry. I, I just, I mean, I'm going to keep emailing you until you say <laughs> no. Um, the response has been amazing. The, the amount of people that have, uh, have connections and say, hey, I've got a friend who teaches in Monterey and they love to have you and like you connect and then you know, a lot of schools that came through and then didn't work out. And it's just like kind of like starting a second business yeah. um, before and after work, which is wild. Um, but it has been so amazing. And so I'm so like excited to do it. Um, it's going to be the trip of a lifetime, um, getting to meet so many kids and teachers and being in schools and living in life in the RV and campgrounds. And I mean, we're going to go everywhere we can and just experience the nation. L life is short, right? It's short. I just turned 40. This is not a midlife crisis, although people have been hinting at that. Um, I think it's just, I'm seeing that there is an expiration, 
right? And my kids are getting older. My daughter's going to be, you know, going in fourth grade. She gets to sit, in, by the way, to national parks for free because of this amazing law as a fourth grader. So I have never been this excited for something. Um, and so I'll be getting to talk about this book all across America, which is which is going to be a dream come true. I'm just so jealous. That's I'm just going to put it out there. I am so jealous. I don't think I could drive an RV, but the the <laughs> I'm jealous about a couple of things. Number one, the just the path that you're taking, literally going across and back again to see a mu- as much yeah. as you can. Number one, so jealous because I really haven't traveled as much as I'd like. Number two, the experience with your family. Like that has just, you know, a whole nother layer on top of being able to share your books and talk to kids. Like I can almost envision a little family memoir book that's got to oh, come absolutely. as a result. It would be great if a book came out of this, you know, uh, that, would, that would be outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, yeah. Oh, it's gonna be amazing. Yeah. And I'm also thinking like all the different places that you're stopping, knowing what you love, knowing what you do, knowing that you write. I could just imagine all of the seeds that are going to be planted for all of those books you mentioned that you don't, you're worried you don't have time to write. I don't think that's going to help you sleep at night about that issue, God. but it'll be amazing. I I think it's amazing. I have um, forwarded your, um, you know, your information and all the things to all the schools that I, I work with because I thought, what a neat thing. I appreciate that. Part of. Just so yeah. excited. So excited. Yeah, New York, New York I'm, I'm grateful. I'm going to be ending in New York, New Jersey, because you guys go a little bit later than PA, which is going to be fun. Yeah. So I've got some dates in uh, early June to fill. Um, and I mean, it's it's just been, I've been blown away by um, the welcomeness. And also, um, I mean, I'm gonna, my teachers will get this. I'm a teacher. I can say this. Teachers, librarians, I love you. But you're the worst at responding to emails. I'm just going to throw it out. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I love it. My wife is like, you have to be kind to everyone. I'm like, I know I'm going to be kind. Everyone's busy. It is an insane. I mean, I, I counted actually today. I deleted 10 emails without reading them. <laughs> so I'm doing what I'm begging people not to do. Yeah. Um, but so many people have welcomed me. And, and when I think about like my kids, like, you know, what do I remember as being a kid? You remember those, those family vacations. I remember my dad packed us in this like conversion van and had like a tv in it and a fold down bed and we went like camping for like a week to like random places in the northeast it was amazing yeah so yeah my, what my kids and i remember the day we told them we were going to do this and we brought this big map to them and we, we it was i want them to to never forget this um and my goal with my writing too has honestly been this is a second job but i'm a writer like slot number seven on my list of things to do in the world and Anytime I can use my writing to give my family an experience is sort of like the win-win. Because, I mean, writing is a hard thing. Uh, Most of us will never be famous. Most of us will never be rich. We don't do it for money. All the money is great. Um, The hunt for fame will kill you. It will make you miserable. Um, But I would would give up my books if it was between my books and my family in a heartbeat. But to be able to channel my love of history and writing books and not take my family on a trip to show them this. Uh, my daughter, this is the first book my daughter read. She got the dedication. Um, it's just been, a, it's been really amazing for that to kind of, uh, to see her grow and to see my family grow. And now to be able to take them on a trip. My, my I will say my, my twins think that we're driving in a monster truck for six <laughs> months. Say that. They're telling their friends at school that we're driving a monster truck across America, which would yeah. be amazing actually. <laughs> Oh, I love it from the perspective of kids, how, how that must seem. Yeah. You're, you're in a monster truck. Well, Uh I will definitely put out my, uh, you know, my feelers for schools in my area. Cause I think when I looked on your tour, you only had one in New York. And so we can do better to get something in there. So just two days in the Finger Lakes. Um, and I would love to spend more time in, in that great state. So yes, we can make it happen. So if someone is listening, a teacher, a librarian, a parent who thinks it's cool, where can they, what's the best place to find you and reach out and make the connection? Best place would be my website, which is matthew-landis.com. If you go to matthewlandis.com, you're going to find a a really cool hairdresser. 
uh, I believe in Utah. That is not me, uh, but he looks like a cool dude. Um, Matthew-Landis.com. You'll see my face and uh, all the information about my tour and about my books, videos, tons of free resources for young writers, um, tons of free videos. Everything on there is free. Um, you can reach out to me that way. Um, it's got my email as well. Um, it's got my route and everything um, you'd want to know. And I do love hearing from readers. I, I, my goal is to respond to every reader email within two weeks, and I'm usually able to make it happen. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the place to go. Yeah, that's a gift as a reader when you reach out and you get that response. That just does something. It just puts you in like you're you're officially a reader and a fan for life when that happens, at least in my in my teaching world. <laughs> no, I totally agree. And and I and I always want readers to know this. I email my favorite authors all the time and they usually respond. Yeah. Tana French is an Irish crime writer, is tremendous, probably the most underrated, I think, writer uh, from Europe today. And she, one year, it took her a year one time, but she responded to an email up front for a year, after a year, or she was digging those out. Um, Eric Larson has responded to my emails. Um, my favorite audiobook uh, narrator, Mark Bram Hall, um, almost every famous author that I've written has responded to an email and it just means the world. So I always want to make that happen if possible, because um, the kids in the system, I always tell authors when I, I did like a workshop on school visits, the kids see you as a celebrity. And you might not feel like one, and you might not even be one, but you are you are a celebrity to them. You are someone who's bringing something new, and you got to lead into that, and you got to connect with them. Um, and emails are important. Nothing is more cold shouldery than an email gone unanswered, <laughs> as I know from experience. Um, so yeah, it is. Emails are such a great way to connect. So yeah, but Matthew-Flanus.com is where you can find all that stuff. Okay. And I will put that into the show notes along with listings of the books we've mentioned, especially your newest National Archive Hunters. I will flag you down later so that I can read the next one. So you don't leave me with that cliffhanger. And I know the parents, when they pick it up, whether they are a middle grader, giving it to someone they know, if they are an adult, they'll be all in, all in for sure. So thank you. That's wonderful. I'm so glad you came to chat with us about it. And I wish you so much fun on your trip. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a real pleasure. And always, it's funny, you never, as much as writers write, we rarely, again, I guess famous people do this a lot, but you rarely talk about your books, like about, you just don't talk about them a lot because your family's sick of hearing about it. And you're, you're, my students think it's funny. My, you know, they're like, oh, you write books. Yeah. Um, and so you, you you just don't do it a lot, but it is fun to kind of talk about the art. Um, and I'm so grateful um, to readers and hosts like yourself for kind of, you know, um, stirring up the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, I've loved it. Thank you. And listeners, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Kid Lit Love. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Kid Lit Love podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes at alitlife.com. And if you want more, you might like to listen to my other podcast called Get Literate. It's a podcast that explores all things books and reading, notebooks and writing, and everything in between to build a life you love. One more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a bookish friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish community of kid lit love. Thanks for listening.